Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back another tackle Tuesday. Got my boy, Tony. Wyatt, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, and Luke. Luke's doing a little uh, cool little experiment right now with some new scent that we are trying out. Scent that we would be applying to both paddle tails and split tails. Guys, this is going to be a good one. Um, A lot of our most viewed videos on YouTube this year have been on swim bait slash paddle tails and rigging, retrieving, catching inshore slams and also and this is the this is the new slam shitty bomber if you guys are watching this i know uh we're recording this for a podcast as well and this is the alabama leprechaun jerk shad uh two of our uh our top selling lures on fishstrong.com and we get a lot of questions about the two of these when to use one versus the other if slam shady so good and it's the best lure ever why you even have this one well there are times that you want to have different types of lures including top water etc there's no one lure that's going to always win 100 of the time except for slam shady <laughs> so guys kick it off who wants to lead with this thing when when do you when do you guys lead when are you leading with one of the two split tail yeah. versus a paddle tail I'll start because I, I just have a really basic decision point and he's a basic guy. I didn't even cut his hair. Yeah. Real basic, real basic. And, and so uh, my default is slam shady um, because it's just proven that we've, we've had it now for I guess a year and a half. It's been working all season. I absolutely love it. It's the paddle tail. Um, but when it's calm and clear conditions, that's the time where I go to the leprechaun. And just so you can see what we're talking about here. So this is the leprechaun. It's the split tail jerk bait. It has great darting motion. It has very little vibration. And that's the reason, right? So very clear water, especially when there's fish are spooky up in the shallows, the quick little darting motion looks really nice and it doesn't have too much vibration to make it seem unnatural. It's not natural for a big paddle tail to be sloshing around and making a much vibration in the shallows. Um, so that's, that's my decision. So otherwise I'm throwing the slam shady and then my decision point is, do I go with the smaller one or the bigger one? And obviously based on the size of the bait. So that's my decision point at, in a nutshell. So, so my decision is a little bit different. I agree with the paddle tail being something you don't really want to use in clear water, but the jerk shad is something that I'll use in clean or dirty water. I was on a recent trip, uh, very dirty water. You know, you couldn't see maybe two or three inches in the water. And I was using the paddle tail, but... I was seeing a lot of shrimp jumping around. I even had a couple jump into my kayak and the jerk shad is something that can resemble a bait fish and it can really uh, effectively resemble a shrimp too, as far as the darting action. And because this has, you know, the gold flash in it and that sort of darker green color really simulates a shrimp really well. So I was throwing the paddle tail at first and I wasn't getting any strikes. Started seeing shrimp jumping around. I was like, okay, let me find something that matches that and immediately started catching reds using the jerk shad and the water was dirty so all a matter of really just matching what's going on around you and you had it rigged on a looks like an owner twist lock hook yeah this is a three aught one sixteenth ounce twist lock and that's the nice thing about all these baits too they all rig up really well on this one hook so you can have it tied onto one rod be able to switch between multiple different types of baits without having to take the hook off yeah, and uniquely different from the two, mine is more based on locating fish. So what I traditionally do is I have a swim bait or paddle tail style of bait covering water to find the school, and then I slow down and methodically pick them apart with a split tail. So mine is more of a you know presentation and finding versus one source being different than the other. Um, and the split tail to me, it depends on how aggressive I'm fishing it. To me, I have found myself in the colder months using less weight 
to where it takes more time for that bait to come back to me and a little bit higher in the column versus the summertime. I traditionally fish it with a heavier twist lock hook and work it more aggressively and work it faster as a twitching jerk bait would be. So to me, it's a time frame year and it's a water covering basis. As far as color goes, I'm also kind of on Tony's side. I like using that particular jerk bait in dirty water as well. It's a, it's a confidence thing to me, and I found that it to work well. But I like to slow down with the jerk bait, cover water with my swim bait. Let's let's talk about uh, jig head sizes and, and hook sizes. Uh, I saw Brandon here ask: Is one fourth ounce jig head with three out hook too small for slam shady bomber or leprechaun? Depends on the depth. It's, uh, the jig head is all about the depth. So the there's not really a three ox size hook will cover all of them pretty well, even the bomber. Um, the bomber is the bigger one, just so you don't, just so you know. So the, the bomber is the five inch thick. The leprechaun is five inches, but really thin. Three ox works great for both. A four ox is probably a little bit better for the bomber, but the, again, the three ox work. And then this little, the smaller one, the 2.0, is three and a half inches and, and pretty thin. So the three out size hooks are good, are, are fine, are adequate. You can do four out. And uh, the weight though is really dependent on the depth you're covering. Yep. Um, so there's not there's not like, oh, you have to get this weight or not. Like the one sixteenth ounce that, that Tony mentioned is awesome for up in the shallows. They, they now came out with a one eighth one. So an eighth ounce weight on this twist lock hook is relatively new. And I, I really like it because it can cover the shallows as well, but also cast a little bit further. But then if I'm fishing like more than two and a half feet of water, I go to a jig head. Um, it'll start with three sixteenths ounce. And then if I'm getting like five feet of water or if there's heavy current, then I'll do a quarter ounce and then even go higher as, as I go deeper. Is that about what you guys do? Yeah, I go for it. I'm usually not fishing any deeper than four feet, really. So I. I pretty much stick to the twist lock. Um, also, where I fish, there's really not much current, so I don't have to worry about that either. But like when I do fish over Bayou Luke, Tampa, those areas, I usually go with like the Texas side jig head or just a, a regular jig head. I like the Texas side because it gives you that, you know, weedless feature, but still the same similar action of a regular jig head. Let me pull one out for those who don't know the Texas eye. That's a, those are solid jig heads. And uh, it's basically like an old school worm hook that has a jig head mounted to the front of it. So it's pretty cool. That way you can have the, the benefits of a jig head where you can get that lure down quicker. Um, but you have the benefits of the worm hook where you can keep it weedless. So this is relatively new as well. And it's been awesome. I'm a big fan. Now, do y'all change any of that scenario in cold water versus warm water? Because for me, I, I use lighter weights in the wintertime just for that bait to take a longer time frame to come back to me at the boat. You know, I can really just work it real, real slow for those cold lethargic fish. Or if I want to do a really hard erratic pop to my rod tip to make that jerk bait just really dark hard to one side, that lighter weight to me allows me to cover a different kind of water column versus summer. I'm a turn and burn kind of guy. Yeah, I think it's like the extreme temperatures, like extreme heat and extreme cold. That's when you really want to slow down, use a lighter weight. And then, like you said, in the in the spring and the fall, the temperatures are more comfortable for the fish. That's when I find they're more aggressive. So, yeah, like using a heavier jig head or a heavier weighted hook, give the lure more of a faster darting action can definitely help. Yeah, well, uh, Captain Justin Napier, one of our insider members, and he's actually been a guest on this podcast. He says, I like the erratic movement of the jerkbait when I'm looking for a reaction bite. The paddle tail really shines in the cooler months when the water is cool and the fish are a little bit slower, in my opinion. Good stuff. And by the way, we got an email from Daniel Nussbaum, the president of Z-Man. And we got, if you guys didn't see the post already, uh, should be this week. We will have the Z-Man Slam Shady Paddle Tails back in, uh, definitely in the Minnow Z to start. We are also going to have a couple new of, uh, or two new for us, but existing molds from Z-Man that they're going to add Slam Shady to, which we're really stoked. And then two more after that, all here before Christmas. So definitely be looking at fishstrong.com. This first round is going to go super fast. 
I'm going to apologize in advance because there's going to be people who are ticked off and we've already told the team we can't go out there as much as we want to and buy them first. We have to let our insider members first. So we're going to notify our insider members first, then the public and, uh, and then us. These are going to go super, super fast uh, based on what we know and how long we've been waiting for them. Uh, this whole COVID thing was an absolutely killer. But I uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Z-Man slam Shady Paddle Tails coming back and some split tails. Whammy. Going to be good. Oh, Very good. So, so why, curious to hear your thoughts on the, the Paddle tail. So why, for those who don't know, is, is fishing the North Carolina, really both both Carolinas. And um, I see you use the Paddle Tails a whole lot more. Do you use split tails much there? Yeah, so really the determining factor for me is the water depth. So Tony was talking earlier, he's not usually fishing more than four feet of water, not a whole lot of current, and he absolutely crushes it with jerk shads up there. Um, I'm very jealous how many how many fish and the quality of fish that he catches on those jerk shads. But uh, here up in the Carolinas, we've got a lot more current, water's really dirty, and I'm fishing deeper water as well. So the paddle tail allows me to cover, I feel like, uh, a little bit more of the depth columns because the action is the tail kicking, right? With the jerk shad, I find that what attracts the bite is twitching that bait and then letting it settle back down to the bottom. I can't work the middle of an open column on a shelf for trout, I find, uh, as well with a jerk shad, just because out in the open water, uh, having to let it settle back down to the bottom takes forever. And I don't think that there's as much action, just in my opinion, uh, as there would be with the paddle tail. Now, Conversely, up in the marsh, when I've got redfish or flounder that are really, really shallow, I am going to pull out that jerk shad if I see that they're sight feeding. Um, specifically for flounder, I had a really good video that came out. And the Alabama leprechaun is a deadly option when those flounder are sitting in, you know, less than a foot of water because they really key in on vertical movements. With paddle tails, you know, in less than a foot of water, I can't really bounce it that well because it's going to come out of the water with the jerk shads that really flutter really well and then settle back down. There's such a much larger window for those flounder to bite. Uh, and I really do crush, I crush it on that jerk shad when it's really, really shallow with the paddle tails. I, I do really good on flounder when it's more than like three or four feet. Um, I haven't had too many opportunities to hit the redfish up, uh, but I know a lot of folks around here, that's their go-to bait, especially up in the grass putting it on an owner twist lock. Um, in my kayak, I don't really get those opportunities. I can't see too high up, um, but I'm trying to do a little bit more of that. And uh, th those redfish I know will definitely crush those things up in the grass as well. Good stuff. I've, noticed, I've noticed something with Wyatt. The better his beard looks, the better his advice gets. <laughs> <laughs> it's science. It's science. Hey, yeah. so John Freeman, one of our probably longest standing insider members and we got a little surprise coming for you john next year and anyone who is uh hitting their five-year anniversary as an insider member john says do you use a loop knot with the texas eye that we just talked about the texas eye jig head so texas eye so i always have or i i mostly have and if those who don't know again that's the one with the the uh, hook that's kind of wobbling around on the jig head um, I've tested out the snug knot just to see if there's any difference. And I, I really can't tell that much of a difference. So I've, I've used them both and they both work. Like Wh I, which I one has a higher, uh, knot strength. The snug knot has a higher knot strength. That's the benefit. So the benefit of the snug knot is higher knot strength. The benefit of a loop knot is more motion in the water. But I think the reason why John asked is because since we have this swivel, um, the motion is now, at least on the back half, is now swiveling around. So that's going to have the good motion in the water. Like looking at, I've, I've done the underwater camera on both and they both have a good wobble. So uh, I think you can go either way. The snug knot, you'll have a little bit higher, higher breaking strength. I personally prefer my knot up to the lure to be a little bit weaker so that when I do, you know, when I do get snagged, it obviously will happen, especially with in deep. Um, I want the break to happen right here. I don't want the break to happen on my line to line knot. That way I can just quickly get my line back, retie another bait, and I'm good to go. So I, I actually prefer to, to make this, this knot just, a, just slightly weaker than everything else so that I can just save time on the water. So I, for that reason, I still use the loop knot, even though I can't tell a difference on effectiveness. Yeah, I would say you can't go wrong with the loop knot. 
especially with those jig heads, you know, sometimes you may rig the lure really close to the head of that jig head and that will keep it from being able to pivot around much. So the loop knot can help if that does happen. And yeah. um, go for it, go for it, honey. I was going to go move, move on to talking about Z-Man baits, how the difference in buoyancy will affect how, uh, how much weight you want to use when using those baits compared to the other traditional soft plastics. So um, Z-Man baits, they're more buoyant. You know, you toss one in the water unrigged, it's going to float on the surface. If you toss uh, some other type of soft plastic, it's going to hit the water and it's going to slowly start to sink. So when you're rigging up, you know, Z-Man baits that are the elastic material, you have to consider rigging them up a little bit heavier than you would if you were using like, uh, for example, compare these two. This is a Z-Man. This is the three inch uh, Minnow Z. This is the 2.0, the Slam Shady 2.0. This one you can rig up. Let's say I rig it up on a 1 ounce weighted hook normally. If I'm rigging the Z-Man Minnow Z, I want to rig that up on about a 1 8 ounce to get that same depth and that same uh, action. Because you'll notice if you rig both of these up on a 1 16th ounce, the Minnow Z is going to ride really high up in the water column and it's almost going to be riding right on the surface. So if you want to work those lures deeper, make sure to go heavier when you're using the Z-Man base because of the buoyancy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And that's a little trick to do if you're, say, I mean, somebody mentioned a, a quarter ounce jig head. Is that good enough? Um, the answer is obviously yes, but you can actually control the depth you're running. Um, say you're in like three feet of water with a quarter ounce jig head is a little bit heavy for three feet of water unless there's a lot of current. Um, you could put the Z-Man material on there and that's going to have it riding up really nice for that three foot. And then if you go down to four or five feet and you don't want to retie or you don't want to have another rod, then you can just take off, you know, undo the, the Z-Man, put on the, uh, the 2.0 version that's a little bit more dense and that'll ride a little bit lower. So that way you can control your depth without having to retie or bring a second rod. Yep. Um, and, and I want to add one more thing before I forget. So on the, on the Texas eye, we kind of sold it pretty well. <laughs> so I want to, I want to kind of caveat it with that. These are, are great for, again, we mentioned before that it's a jig ad that's weedless. They're really bad for skipping. So if you're trying to skip under docks or anything, the fact that it pivots, it is awful for skipping. So skipping under docks, I use um, a traditional jig head that's, that has that little weed, that uh, wire re uh, weed guard. Um, but for like buzzing over oyster bars and stuff like that, these are excellent. But for skipping, they're, they're, they're awful. So have you tried, when you find you're having issues skipping, have you tried purposely pushing the, the lure closer up to the head of the jig head to keep it yeah. wobbling? It too? helps. It helps. It's still not as good as a normal jig head, just because that normal one's it's fixed and it, it'll have a flat paint plane that's fixed. And um, so, yeah, until what Tony's saying is just rig it much further up. That way, the head is kind of fixed. It'll still wobble a little bit, but yeah, it, it significantly helps. But um, I still prefer the the uh, traditional weedless jig head because just that little wire guard. It's, it actually works pretty pretty good. Do you? Uh... I'm curious when you guys on a split tail, are you ever using jig heads or, or, or very rarely? I haven't seen you, Wyatt, Luke. Very the only rarely. Time I, rarely. Yeah. Whenever I'm doing a jig head is when I'm in a trout bite only and I don't set the hook. Um, but that was back home in Texas and Louisiana. Um, you know, to me, all you had to do is this real line pressure and you've got the fish hooked um, versus Florida was, it was different just because of the redfish scenario where you would put, you know, some good pressure on it. But most of the time it's all a, a, a warm hook or weedless approach for me. Okay. So we're, we're agreeing that on the split tail, like a jerk shad, we're not using a jig head very rarely. <laughs> not very as rarely. often. Okay. Sometimes it's, not as often. Cause I, I just, I'd love the paddle tail. Cause the paddle tail, you get that, that fall, the, the fall of the tail is just, is just doing a nice little dance on the way down. And a lot of strikes happen then. Um, so that's like, anytime I'm using a quarter ounce jig head or more, it's, it's the paddle tail just because that added benefit. So back to the paddle tail. Now, what percentage time do you use a jig head versus like, uh, an owner twist lock hook, a weighted hook? 50, 50. To me, it's based on the structure I'm fishing. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of oyster bars up here in the Carolinas. Um, and when I'm fishing shallow water, 
usually those reds will push up, not even necessarily onto the oyster bars, but there's a bunch of scattered shells and stuff. And I'm usually working the bottom because those fish that are in shallow water, they're usually punching around for crustaceans and stuff, even if flounder are shallow. But my bait is usually closer to the bottom. And that's when I'm going to put on those taxis, those under twist locks, just because you're going to get hung up if you tried to do twitch, twitch pause at all. So it's really situation dependent, but I wouldn't say that I, yeah, I, I don't use it too often. I would say. Tony, I feel like you've caught some of your biggest redfish and snook with the twist lock on a paddle tail. Or is that yes. just me? With, with the fish over here, well, back when there was some grass left, you know, I was using that twist lock to just basically run that paddle tail just above the grass. If you use a jig head, most often than not, you're going to cast it out. And as before you can, you know, close the bale and get your lure retrieved, it's already in the grass. And then you're trying to get grass off of it half the time you're retrieving it. So if you rig it weedless, cast it out, start retrieving it, and you don't have to worry about getting snagged up. Yeah, but the 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 split tails do work good on jigs. I mean, a lot of people I've seen a lot of people with really nice fish on jigs. So it's not to say that it it doesn't work. Um, I I think a lot. I think we often are fishing a little bit shallower water. Uh, like I've seen Justin late, left a comment on here um, that he uses the split tail in like fifteen to twenty feet of depth, and that's a that's a very important thing to think about because to get that far down with that paddle as it's going down that's water drag like as that tail is is fluttering that's just drag on the bait it's going to make it sink slower and so for fish in the deeper water uh, just to get down there which is depth control is incredibly important and so a lot of a lot of it comes to depth control if if you need to get down deeper and you don't have a really like probably need like a, a ounce weight to get a paddle tail down that deep if you don't have a really heavy weight you're if you don't get down there you're not going to catch anything so you might as well um, use something that's more streamlined so it shoots down. Um, even though I've seen using the um, the 2.0, it has like a really thin tail. Um, every once in a while, a puffer or whatever will, will bite it, take the tail off, and I'll keep using it. And I've actually caught some of my best fish without the tail, particularly on the deeper ends of the dock. And and the reason, at least I think a big reason, is because it just it sinks down faster. So my retrieve is actually right on the bottom where most of the action happens. And, uh, and if I had the tail on, it would have been raised up a little bit too high in the column. So a, a lot of it's depth control. I think I agree too with Mark about the type of species. Um, not so much, I haven't really tried it too much with the jerk shad, but you know, I've used it with a gulp shrimp, which is very similar. It's like a stick uh, type of bait. I've tried the gulp shrimp on a twist lock hook and I wasn't catching anything. Switched to a jig head and I started catching trout because they like that more erratic darting retrieve. So uh, I think the type of species you're going after can definitely play a factor in how you want to rig it up, either a jig head or a um, twist lock hook based on how active the fish are. Cool. Yeah, ideally though, to, to, to go on the jig head side though, on the swim bait, to me, I would always prefer an exposed hook when I can get away with it. So again, like what Tony was saying, I like fishing grass and I can't necessarily get away with a jig head in that scenario because all I'm doing is dredging the bottom. Uh, but when I can get away with using a jig head, I would much prefer to go that way because my hookup ratio is so much better uh, with an exposed hook versus one that has to kind of penetrate through the plastic. Cool. I saw uh, Jake Brand again. Oh, go for it, Tony. I was going to say that comes down to rigging too, because you can, you know, you can get away with rigging the slam shady by poking the hook out the top and just not even skin hooking it, just letting it rest there. And that'll still keep it pretty weedless. And also this is a, a tip I shared in another video. You can actually rig them upside down. The slam shady, the 2.0 has a slot in the belly. And so does the bomber. If you rig them upside down, go ahead and show you here. That hook basically lays in that slot. And it doesn't even have to have to push through the plastic. All it has to do, fish strikes and the hook points exposed because the hook's just sitting in that slot and you still get the same action out of it. So just a little counter there, <laughs> Mark, as far as rigging up on jig heads and twist lock hooks. And, and a lot of it is motion too. I'll, I'll show you an interesting story last week. And so I was trying to catch ladyfish 
and ladyfish they really like a quick start Wait, you were through. trying to catch ladyfish yeah, i was doing a cut bait yeah sorry i should have i should have kept it i was doing a cut bait lesson we've had some requests for it so i was going out to catch ladyfish to use as cut bait okay okay and uh and the little junk fish was tearing, tearing up the tail so it was about that size and this um this front part was all gnarled up so it was one of those situations what do you, why do you have a funny term for it you get pants or whatever you know when you cast it it slides down the hook super frustrating so I got tired of it, so I rigged it backwards. Like I literally had this little nub tail, and I rigged it on the tail. Kids at home, please do not follow this advice. No, no, listen, listen. So I rigged it just like this, and as long as it's this is kind of a poor rigging job. So as long as it doesn't look like this, where it's all, <laughs> as long as it doesn't look like this, where it's all uh, curled up like a snake. Um, if, if it's if it's linear, if it has a good darting motion, fish will hit it. And literally with this tail, let me do it. So let me do myself a little bit better justice. <laughs> I got 10 bucks on there ain't any fish hitting that bait. Yeah, you're right. Maybe maybe a puffer. Maybe right? a blind bass. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so anyhow, so I was literally trying to catch ladyfish. And uh, and like three casts later, this one's a little bit better. But this is a nice linear little darty motion. Three casts later, this is the natural head of it. Three guys later, I hooked in this big fish. And it was like a 30-inch snook. And it broke me off because I wasn't ready for it. Like the line was a little dinged up. And, and so it just goes to show that it, everything doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be like the perfect paddle tail or not paddle tail. If it just has a good darty motion and looks like, a, like something that they're going to eat, like a small bait fish or an injured or a scared shrimp, they're going to take a swipe at it. So, so uh, what I'm hearing you say is Slam Shady 2.0 is now 3.0. So you got <laughs> the swim bait paddle tail tail gets bitten off by a puffer now all of a sudden you got kind of a little jerk shad and then if you flip it upside down now you got a ned rig Looks yeah like I mean, a you'll see the video coming out it's all on film uh, i'm just so bummed that like i was that was like i was so bummed when that thing got off because it would have you would have seen that that little nub um it works so it's, not, it's really about having good motion i mean the the core purpose of a lure is to you need to get on the proper depth you need to have a lure that's good enough and give it some good action and, and fish will even good fish will eat it surprisingly frequently. Yeah. I, uh, I actually have an insider report that's up and you can see the video. Cause I had my camera rolling when I did it, there were some reds and this is before the Alabama leprechaun came out. So I didn't have the option to use it, but I had the 2.0 and the reds were really, really skittish and they were really, you know, picky. I took my 2.0 and ripped it off to about that size. It looked exactly like a Ned rig. And that's what I was thinking of when I did it. Uh, there's just a bunch of really small shrimp jumped around. This is in the spring down in South Carolina, but I've the video purposely ripping off the tail down to that nub and just really tiny twitch, twitch, pause, twitch, twitch, pause. And I caught like a, it was like a 25, 26 inch redfish um, on that nub, went further down the channel and caught another one. It was like yeah, that, that paddle tail, if you take the tail off, you can now turn it into a jerk sad essentially because um, you can make a dart and stuff like that so i guess that is a pro over the jerk shad you can't turn the uh the jerk shad into a paddle tail but you can turn the paddle tail into a jerk shad and a little ned that thing looked like a little that's little stub yeah and and the, and the same premise holds that's that's why i really like soft plastics is because you can control the the size like why you nailed it where you saw the smaller bait fish so you purposely tore stuff off like even these jerk baits i used to use the gulp ones all the time um but for all of them it works where like bait fish will eventually start tearing it off. And even the small little nubs, if it's just this little, this little nub, uh, I've got some of my best fish on it and it skips better, like skipping under mangroves, the little nubs skip incredibly well. And if there's smaller bait fish in the area, it's your advantage to shrink it down. And so with soft plastics, if you, you can go ready for the bigger stuff. And then if you on the water and you see small stuff, just rip the tail off. You don't have to retie to get a different lure and you can be catching more fish because of that, that time saving. So. That's a, a, a big reason why I love soft plastics. And for um, those of you that fish for small juvenile tarpon and you get frustrated because they won't hit your lure, before we had the Slam Shady, I would take some white paddle tails. I was throwing them for small tarpon. They weren't hitting. And I did the same thing. I cut the tail off, made a smaller profile, and it was just a nub on a jig head. And that's what they started hitting. So just that small change in profile can definitely help. I've had redfish under dock lights hit the actual split tail of the Alabama leprechaun. Like I took, I took the like fat body part of the leprechaun off and I put the, uh, it was on a, a twist log. I literally just took, cause I don't have the leprechaun in front of me. Luke, if you can hold it up, like the back, 
They use the back, the back half. Yeah, about that size, put it on a twist lock. And the hook was literally sitting between the tail and I skin hooked it onto the back. I've had redfish hit just that exactly like that, but it was, I don't, I don't know exactly what the bait was that they were hitting under that dock light, but it was so small, just dragging it on the surface, like no action. And they will hit that. Um, so Jake Brannigan asked how much does color matter for soft plastics? And ironically, Jake was one of the first people on here and he posted, he actually caught a couple of fish this morning on the slam shady bomber. So I, I love reading books. Uh, this is one, whoa, just lost my note. Uh, this is one I just read. It's about using color technology to catch more fish. We did a whole podcast about this one. That's uh, if you guys are listening on this podcast, it's what fish see. Uh, this is by Dr. Colin Kajiyama, who's helped design tons of lures. And it's interesting. They they all agree, and, and so have many of the guests, and so have probably most saltwater anglers. And it's interesting, this talks about everything. You can see he's got bass, he's got a redfish on here, got musky walleye. They talk about all types of fish. And in general, it seems that white and even black are two colors that tend to work all the time, kind of anywhere. And when I had uh, Mark Sosin on, you know, he had shared back in World, World War II, they gave every one of the, the soldiers there uh, a little survival kit. And guess what was in the survival kit? It was a little bit of fishing line and a white bucktail because they knew a white bucktail is one of those lures, one because of color and one just because it's it's so versatile that it can kind of catch fish anywhere. And it's the one lure you have if you had a survival kit. So what both these books talked about was that some colors have that underwater color shift and, and red is the most obvious one. Um, let's see here. So if a red object is placed in a few feet of clear blue water, it cannot reflect red because the red wavelength is filtered out by the water and the objects show black. Um, a lot of, he calls it a black shift in this, uh, this book. So there's certain colors that 100% make a difference. Uh, this guy who also works for one of the biggest bass fishing lure makers, he pokes fun at, at uh, the realistic lures. He's like, it, it, he's like, some of these things are so realistic. It, they're almost like camouflaging in with the area that you're fishing, right? He's like, you don't want them to look that real. That's why some of these simple paddle tails that, that, that mimic the motion and look like a real bait fish, but they don't have real eyeballs and real little circles and dots and lateral lines. He's like, Listen, the goal of your lure is to get nailed. You do not want this thing surviving is what he says. He's like, I've seen some of the most asinine lures made that cost a fortune. They look so realistic and they're horrible at catching fish. And I thought that was really interesting from a guy who, who designs, uh, designs lures. Um, but Luke also hit it, just being candid. Color is very, very important. This guy says it's at the very top, but he also says it's right there with, you got to have action first. You got to have something that looks good in the water and looks natural and then you got color and then you got scent as well all three of those combined to have a lure that's going to consistently work <clears throat> uh, most of the time nothing works 100 percent of the time unfortunately or they would just call the sport catching and not fishing uh thoughts on that ramble of uh of my color because i love reading this stuff i i'm just like you i'm always trying to get an edge right i want to know all these little small things and it's interesting that no one has come up with a perfect color but that whole white off white with a little bit of sparkle which is why we came up with slam shady and trademarked it is because this is proven to work over and over again pretty much anywhere you got predator fish yeah it's a good one i i was gonna say i did a i did a segment on um I the it was a tip video i can't remember which one it was but i actually put up a color chart uh and the the color reduction spectrum really occurs on two levels and it's actually dependent on the tint of the water, clear water versus murky water. And it was interesting to see which colors showed up um, on both of those two spectrums. And really clear water right behind white was actually blue. Like if it's if it's like offshore clean blue water, like bright blue is a, actually a really good color to use. But you get into the dirty water, bright blue is like very bottom of the spectrum. Then it's 
uh, fluorescent orange and yellow, which is why chartreuse tends to work really well in those uh, those waters. But white is even ahead of those because if you think the color reduction occurs because that light comes through the surface of the water, if there's more sediment um, and murk in the water, less light's getting through. So that white has the ability to reflect the most light, which is why it leads in both categories, regardless of you know what other colors are on that spectrum. Some will perform better in clear water, versus dirty water, but white is the leading factor in both if you look at any color reduction spectrum chart. Um, cool little study here. So he's talking about how predator fish forage by sight, um, which is going to talk about the action and the color, right? So it says, in an experiment, Dr. Lauren G. Hill found that fish use sight almost 100% in their selection of food. Yes, they are influenced by sound, smell, texture, and taste, but sight is their dominant sense by far. How did we determine this? This is pretty awesome. We put translucent caps over the fish's eyes and found that they could only find natural food, which was crawfish, in 6%, 6 not 60, 6% 6 of the times offered. But when they took the caps off their eyes and then plugged their olfactory opening so they could not smell the food, they found the food 100% of the time. It's pretty interesting. So it became very obvious that the fish may know that food is nearby through their senses, but if they can't see it, they have a really, really hard time getting it. I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty cool study there by a well, real scientist. That's how I find my food. <laughs> no, it usually starts by smell for me. <laughs> I can see a fast food restaurant from miles away before I smell it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Let's talk about <laughs> we talked about rigging, talked about colors here. Let's talk about size, right? People sometimes, especially maybe some newer anglers, like, all right, well, what's the difference between a three and a, and a five inch? Uh, you know, and you have a lot of different sizes now of these jerk shads or split tails as uh, well. How, how, what are your What are your thoughts when you guys go to a smaller versus uh, versus bigger times of the year, matching the hatch? Just what you're feeling like. What What uh, What's the answer? I would say time of the year and also water clarity. Darker water, I think the bigger baits excel just because a bigger bait's going to make a lot more commotion. It's more of a pressure change as it's moving through the water. Even if it doesn't have a paddle tail on it, just the movement of that bigger bait going through the water is going to create a pressure change, which those fish can pick up with their lateral line. And as far as, you know, the baits that do have the paddle, um, if you're fishing dirty water, that paddle definitely helps. Doesn't matter if it's a five inch bait or a three inch bait, that paddle can help. And again, dirtier the water, I'll go with a bigger bait. But then it comes down to the season, time of year. At the end of the year and in into the fall, you know, bait fish are at their biggest. They've had all year to, to pretty much grow. And it's gonna be ideal to match the size of the, those bait fish. But I really feel that you can't go wrong with a three to four inch bait all year long. That's pretty much my go-to. But if I find that they're kind of, snubbing that smaller bait then i'll move up to a bigger bait and see if they strike yeah same here yeah i basically for paddle tails my default is four and then if it's fall like it is now i'm only using the five just because the the, the fish are honed in on it and it helps me cast further you can cover cover more ground more obama obama and then in like late winter early spring when the, there's a lot of small bait fish like the situation where wife's talking about where you're seeing all the little glass minnows, like the little small things. That's when I, I use nubs. That's when I save all, all my messed up ones. Um, I save those for when the bait's small. That's before, hopefully before Otis uh, eats them. And yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Otis is, uh, he's been known to eat some slam shadies and leprechauns. Um, but, but for the leprechaun, the, the difference though, is that when I'm doing split tails, I'm almost always using the five inch ones. Um, because, uh, and Tony hit on it earlier, this does a really good job of mimicking shrimp. And in many cases, the shrimp are a little bit bigger, or at least I want, I want to be bigger than what's out there. Um, because when you do, do this on a weighted hook and give that dark, that double twitch motion, it, it looks just like looking at the underwater footage. It looks just like a, square, a, a scared shrimp coming out of the grass and then slowly going down and those fish hammer it. 
Uh, but if I'm using it and I see all little small stuff, that's the the very rare instance when I purposely will take um, a split tail off to a nub. So that's basically my. And I, I know there's some four inches now in the split tail that are selling pretty well. Yeah, the smaller it is, the the shorter you can cast is the, is the downfall. Like if you're doing the finesse fishing, like like everybody was talking about earlier, where you you have it on the weighted hook, fishing slow. Um, as you as that material gets smaller, that's just less weight to cast. So that's just that's one thing to think about. And particularly in the winter time when it's really clear water, um, and those fish are up in the shallows, casting distance is incredibly important. And um, and so for that reason, I, I would rather have a five inch that's that's nub down to a four than a four inch that's designed to be four inches, just for castability. Yeah, but I think the four inch still has a marketplace when you're matching the hatch as well. So I agree, the five is more versatile long long term, but four inch is certainly there as as a need for the match the hatch timeframes of the year. Yeah, like in the in the winter time, if you're sight fishing reds and really clean water, or even trout, that four inch bait can work really well, like a four inch jerk shad. But you want to also think about you know your gear. You you could bump down to eight pound line that will help you cast better. Uh, your positioning will help you cast better. You know if you have the wind to your back, you're sight casting those fish, and also the current. You know those smaller, lighter uh, baits. You can use a current to bring those baits to the fish. So some different things to different ways to think about it there. Have you done that yet, Tony? Have you uh, gone down to eight pound? Right. I haven't yet. No, but it's something I've been wanting to do because I have been in that situation where I'm casting a bigger bait to those fish and sight fishing and I'm getting a nice long cast with the, you know, that bigger bait, 10 pound line, but just making such a big splash in the winter time, those fish are really finicky with that really clear water. So, you know, bumping down an eight pound line that will help increase your casting distance. And it's still plenty strong to fight those fish out in the open flats, you know, as long as you're not fishing around structure. Cool. I saw Brandon's got a question here uh, with it being November and it's really hot outside. Uh, yeah. In the eighties, what water, at least here in Florida, uh, maybe a little bit cooler where you are. What mock, mock turtleneck weather is it getting mock turtleneck weather. Not yet. It's do you do you own a mock turtleneck? I'm not gonna make it <laughs> with that beard. Oh golly! All right, let's just skip the question. This is oh, I don't even want to think about it. Uh, with it being hot, what water temper is, is optimal to be considered winter fishing in y'all's opinion? Man, uh, it's tough to even think about winter fishing when it's eighty something degrees in November. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I personally don't even look at my weather gauge and my temperature gauge. And it's, if, if it's, if, a, if like once about four or five legit cold fronts come through and that's when it's winter, in my opinion, <laughs> once it's significantly colder, right, colder than it was three weeks before, then those fish are on the move. Um, they're, they're not sitting there waiting with a thermometer looking for a specific temperature. They're, they're either going to feel comfortable or they're not. And, and as they get more and more cold, they're going to be moving and they're going to be moving to the warmer pockets. So. And, uh, Justin Napier, uh, who is a great captain down there in South Florida, you guys should all book him. Uh, he says when the water temps dip into the mid to low seventies, that's when he considers a lot of these predator fish to go into winter mode, uh, which is pretty consistent. Some of them, uh, meaning you got different types of species, obviously some of them are a little bit more tolerant than others. Uh, but that for the most part, that is, that is correct. And that varies on region too. Say, I'm just gonna... Yeah, that, that varies on region too. Like a North Carolina fish is just used to the colder temperatures so they can handle the colder stuff. So um, so we don't want to say like that Justin's down in, in uh, Marco or Naples area. Um, and so I think that in like Wyatt's fish would would probably handle the colder stuff much better because they're just used to it. So the absolute is different. And even like a fish in 72 degrees that was just in 65 degrees is going to be really active and if the water was just 60, 75, and now they're at 72, now they're uncomfortable. So a lot of it's on relativity. So I, I would say focus more on the on the trending relative temperature versus like an absolute. Um, yeah, so I was about to say the same thing because Texas and Louisiana water might be in the high 60s where Florida water might be in the mid 70s, but fish the same time frame of the year. 
So I, again, it's just geographically and, and, and placement, you know, and species too, like snook get, get really uncomfortable really fast to the point where they could literally die if it's too cold. Whereas like, I feel like trout kind of handled the best and then redfish are in between. Isn't that funny? They're, they're called weak fish and the weakest fish, but they're pretty tough. They can handle, they can handle cold temps. Yeah. So I was going to, I sort of base it on whether or not I have to wear a jacket every time I <laughs> go on the water. <laughs> if I have to go out there and wear a jacket, I'm fishing as if I'm fishing in the wintertime. And then if I have to take my jacket off, like by 11 o'clock noon, then I'm going to start pushing up shallower because the fish are doing the same thing. They're getting warmer too, if the shallows are getting warmer. So I always yeah. base it off whatever I'm doing. Tony That's is hard. a fish. That's the conclusion. Yeah. I just think like, like a fish. fish. Like Tony, fish. Tony do, but outside of your massive costume collection closet, do you own a mock turtleneck? I don't even know what that is. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Go ask Wyatt afterwards. And, and, and Good I think answer. Clarify <laughs> costume closet as well. Is that like what uh, Eddie wears in Christmas Vacation? <laughs> Very <laughs> good. Yeah, please do clarify for our viewers and listeners who uh, don't know about uh, how amazing that you rock Halloween. Uh, maybe you can let everyone know that what your costume closet is that you you don't have some kind of little side gig that's a little bit weird. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, did some Beetlejuice costumes on Halloween. <laughs> that was the big thing. Really got into it more this year, but. Yeah, I did it two nights around Halloween, and it took three, three and a half hours to do the makeup and all that. Did it by myself. <laughs> it, it was amazing. It looked better than the Beetlejuice in the movie. Yeah, it was. I have a picture here I can pull up. It was spot on. Like, I haven't seen the movie in a really long time. When I saw Tony's picture, I was like, that is really good. And then when I saw, when I pulled an old clip of the movie, I was like, that is amazing. Like, it is, it is spot on. It is, it is awesome. <laughs> Um, I didn't. I didn't know what that turtleneck was either, Tony. So yeah. <laughs> that's good. Eesh. I might be able to pull up a picture here by the end of the call. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's just go real time right now. Uh, what are you leading with? Paddle tail, split tail, bomber, hundred percent, Obama. Yeah, Obama. Mm, I don't know. I'm I'm torn. <laughs> If I had to pick one lure to bring with me all the time, it would probably be the jerk shad. That's just my confidence lure. Before I started using the Alabama leprechaun, I was using the gulp jerk shad like 99.9% .9 of the time. It's just my confidence go-to lure, clear water, dirty water. It's really just a matter of knowing how to use that lure because paddle tails are a little bit easier to use. Uh, they're kind of foolproof. The jerk shad, it takes a little bit more uh, you know, technique yeah, and, and the jerk shad requires the rigging to be spot on uh, like is it because there's just less there's um the motion it has to be kind of doing like a dark like almost like a zero spook underwater where you're twitching and it's kind of going up and down side to side as soon as it's helicoptering like if it's not rigged really well it's going to helicopter and it's not going to work but when you rig uh, with the split tail rig properly it is it is one of the best baits. It's the best shallow water bait i've ever used like when i was doing tournaments that's literally all we used for split tails on weighted hooks now, have any of y'all done any kind of perimeter weighting on your jerk baits? Like cut the split fork off the back end and put like a little small nail in the back end to where the lure falls exactly, you know, horizontal versus a nose forward fall. Have any of y'all done any kind of experiments with that? Never tried that. That'd be cool. Is that, is that something they teach you at bass school? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's huge. So tell, uh, tell me exactly what you're doing. Like what kind of size little, you said a little nail, a little weight? Yeah. So in the bass world, you know, we do it with Senkos. We do it with jerk baits, you know, something with a blunt end. When we cut the fork off the jerk bait, we now have a flat end. We'll put a small little finishing nail in the back end of the bait. So you have the weight from either, you know, your hook source and or jig head and now you have a perimeter weighted and now the, the lure falls horizontally through the water column instead of nose down through the water column so those that are really looking for a a you know bait fish that's kind of dying off and it's kind of just fluttering through the water column that perimeter weight helps with that method so i haven't i haven't done that but what me and luke do with the owner twist lock hook is you can take the weight 
with a pair of pliers and sort of twist it and you can slide it back, you know, further towards the, of course it doesn't want to do it now, but you can <laughs> slide it back further towards the bend of the hook. So the weight is a little bit more further back and you can also slide it up further towards the nose. Let's see if we can get it to come off here. There you go. So you can see I slid it up to the nose and then you can slide it back down towards the uh, bend of the hook. And then once you have it in position, you just squeeze it like a split shot. That'll help keep it into position. It's not going to fall as straight or as, you know, horizontal as it would if you had like a nail in the back end, but it helps it fall a little slower when you push that weight back on the hook. Yeah. It's a surprisingly big difference. Just moving that weight. It's like a half inch movement. Um, but it's a big deal. And that's, that's, an, that's another reason why I really like those owner hooks. They're not made for it, but after you catch a, a fish or two, like as that hook flexes a little bit, it'll break the glue or like what Tony did, he just broke it with the pliers. Um, it'll move up and down. And once you actually stop it, you can cast really hard at the up position. It'll stay there. Um, so I, I'm, uh, that's, I'm, I, I always have those hooks on one of my rods when I'm out because it's, it's awesome for the shallows. Basically when I go out, I have, a hook, I have two rods. I rarely take more than that. I don't like clutter. One has the weighted hook, one has a jig head, and I'll decide which one I'm using just based on depth, depth alone. And both of those baits too, we, which we haven't even segmented into, are also very, very good baits behind bladed jig heads or like a chatter bait style of jig head. They both work extremely well if you want to have that flash component added on to it. Yep. Love it. Well, cool guys. Um, I think we got to most of the questions. There's a couple of funny ones in there. Thank you, Johnny Kelly. Uh, I was laughing at earlier. I was just reading, reading That's some good. of these. You guys wanted to see uh, the costume. I got it pulled up here. Right. I'll see it. Thank you, Ron Miller. Always. Uh... <laughs> there I am. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, is epic. Hilarious. We'll have to put a, a picture in the, in the show notes. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, you guys, uh, we'll, we'll go back. Good vibrations, Joey Antonelli. Um, we'll go back into these uh, comments because I know we tend to get a lot of comments afterwards and, uh, and, and maybe even do some specific videos. I know we get a ton of questions about the, you know, the, the different types of rigs and more importantly, when to use which lure and then when to use what type of, of, uh, of jig head or twist lock hook, et cetera. Uh, so we'll make sure to go though, uh, go back and answer some of those questions. And then also please post uh, a yes or no. If you want Wyatt to wear a mock turtleneck in our next video, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping the answer is yes. I sure want to see him. And, uh, and then finally fishstrong.com to go get your Alabama leprechauns. And now quite a few different types of slam shady paddle tails. And as I mentioned sometime this week, we will have the Z-Man Minnow Z back. That was the top selling Minnow Z color in the world. Uh, yes, in the entire world for that uh, actual body. And it's proof the sucker just works and it works and it works and it lasts, which is what everyone loves about those Z-Man baits. So yes, uh, we have confirmed that it was the number one seller in the entire world that includes Japan and Australia, where those guys and gals there, they like to fish and they love their lures. Just don't call them baits like I did. I got called out. Just throwing the, you know, you just said bait and, well, that ain't a bait. Down, down under, it's a lure. A bait is stinks. It's a live bait only. This lure here too, Joe. Let's, let's be honest. Yeah, but it's interchangeable as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. It's like saying rod or pole. I don't get mad when someone calls it a pole. I call it a rod. I think, but, you know, down under, oh boy. We'll break a rod over a, your back, call it a pole. What's the species count of the slam shady paddle tails now? Is it in the 70s? Uh, I believe it's 80 now. Um, and, and keep in mind, we're not like it's a way over 100 if we like counted all the different species of shark. We just have like shark. Um, and, and so because otherwise you can get a little bit carried away with all the different uh, variations of, uh, of sharks. Um, but maybe we'll break it out at some point, but yeah, it's, it's 80 like legit different, uh, unique species, which is pretty awesome. So if you guys don't know, we are trying to break a world record. I think we might already be there. I don't even know. I, I, I haven't seen what the world record is for, you know, one specific color, one paddle tail and, uh, 80 different species. So if you guys catch something unique 
let us know. Tag us on Instagram or shoot us an email, uh, fish at saltstrong.com uh, with a picture or video. You got to have documented proof. It can't be just your word because let's face it, you're a fisherman. So guys, thank you so much. We, uh, we love doing these things. If you have any other topics you want us to cover, let us know as well. Uh, we did a, a recent one here, uh, depending on if you're listening on the podcast or watching this live, uh, did a couple on reels. Uh, we did some on uh, bay casting versus spinning. We're going to do some things on rods coming up soon. That's been a question we get a lot. And, uh, and also uh, we did a really fun one on unique lures right now. S- still, even though... Uh, you would think after seven, eight months of dealing with this COVID, things would get better. It's still tough to get to get a lot of products. Uh, I mean, we're still us and everyone else is still struggling to get a lot of the products we used to. So we're uh, we're having to look at some unique places. Uh, but good news is we got slam shading, we got leprechaun in the house. Well, things stuck to my finger there in the house. Uh, final question, Luke, Tony, Mark, Wyatt. If you had to eat one, which one would you eat? The paddle tail or the split tail? Paddle tail, the jerk shad looks like Dookie. <laughs> <laughs> the jerk shad would go down smoother. That's true. Yeah, can you imagine that one, like the very end? Of <laughs> paddle tail going down. I don't know. Otis, Otis has pooped out like six or seven slam shady so far, so I'm, I'm going to have to go with that. He must. There must be something good about him. He's only, he's only pooped out one leprechaun. Wow. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about either of them. <laughs> I don't think I can do that. What if one of them smelled like a cheeseburger from the, you, you mentioned that you can s- smell this fast food or no, you go by sight. You go by sight. Anyhow. I go by sight. Oh, that wouldn't work anyhow. Yeah. We'll get a che- <laughs> cheeseburger scented. Paddle <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. Well, stay tuned. Got a lot of uh, new content coming your way. Insiders. Uh, Wyatt's working on a really cool mini course. We're starting to add some more of these mini courses in your library. Uh, so stay tuned. And of course, if you're an insider member, 20% off the entire store, got the holidays coming up. We got a lot of new stuff coming in. We just got Daiwa BGs. Uh, what else do we get with, we got some other Daiwas, didn't we Mark yesterday? Yeah, we got, um, BGs, we had Certates, um, a, a little bit of a ballistic lineup. So Daiwa is just now starting to ship. Now they came from a different factory than what the Fuego did. So the Fuegos are, uh, a couple of weeks behind the BG stuff, but I was told to expect them late November, early December timeframe on the, on the Fuegos. Cool. But unfortunately dates have been moving around quite a bit. So I'd like to see a little bit more concrete stuff first. No Fuego. No Fuego. No Fuego. But we'll be saying yes, Fuego when those suckers come in, dog gone. Talk see? about waiting a long time. Um, all right, guys. I think that's all I got. Have an awesome rest of the day. Thank you guys who all watched and commented live. How we digress. Yes, how we digress. Talking about eating and pooping saw plastics. What in the world? Guys, we appreciate you. Uh, let us know any other topics you want us to talk about by leaving a comment uh, and or just hitting us up at saltstrong.com. We always put the show notes on there in the podcast section or email us at fish at saltstrong.com. That's fish at saltstrong.com. Otherwise, we are out. Cause fish in my soul in-